You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. These people mindlessly asked for the release of a cold-blooded murderer instead of the sinless Savior, the Lamb of God. And so, no doubt with this crowd, some of the people there earlier in the week who cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Certainly some of those same people were here in this crowd and they're crying out, crucify him. And so this whole scene also sadly points to the fickleness of unredeemed men. Imagine how Jesus must have felt to be standing before his people, whom he came to save, as they yelled, crucify him. In today's message, Pastor Ron speaks on the fickleness of mankind, both in that moment and now. The Jews at the time had their own intentions for Jesus. And how often do we also deny him because we have our own plans? Jesus has gone to deeper lengths for you than anyone ever will. Will you choose to make him the king and Lord of your life today? Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 18 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. Take out your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John chapter 18. Just to remind you, we're in the middle of where we left off last time. We left off and we're in the middle of the trial before Pontius Pilate. But I want to back up just to, especially if you've only been coming for a while, to kind of catch you into deeper context. From chapter 13 of John all the way through chapter 17 is one passage, one section. And it begins in the upper room. Chapter 13 begins in the upper room. So we're in the last week in the life of Jesus, beginning in chapter 13. And chapters 13 through 17 give us insights that none of the other gospel accounts give us. Some instruction that Jesus is giving his disciples just prior to going to the cross. And then we come to chapter 18, which we're at today. And in the beginning part of chapter 18, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, of course, he prays to the Father, and he rises from his knees in victory. And as his enemies are coming to arrest him, he goes to them. He, he's not trying to hide. He's not trying to run. He's going. He's purpose. It's for the purpose he came, to be arrested and go to the cross. And, and they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they literally all fell down. They, he just wanted them to know whom they're, who he, he's allowing them to arrest him, the Lord of all glory. And then it says that they led him away to trial. And that's where we've been at for some time. Now, let me remind you that the trial of Jesus was twofold, had two parts. First, a religious trial, then secondly, a civil trial. And in his, first, his religious trial, it had three phases. He stood before Annas, who was really the godfather of all of the, you know, religious corruption going on in Jerusalem. Then he literally went next door to Caiaphas, who was his son-in-law, who was the high priest at the time. And there the beatings begin. And then finally, in the early hours of the morning, he stands before the Sanhedrin, and they accuse him of blasphemy. So Jesus has been up all night, all early hours of the morning. They've beaten him and so forth. And then they take him at the early hours of the morning, as soon as the day dawns, to stand before Pilate. This is the civil trial, and this civil trial had three phases as well. First before Pilate, then before Herod, and then back before uh, Pilate again. And that's where we find ourselves. We only saw phase one in verses 28 through 38. And you know what the conclusion of Pilate was as he, he sees Jesus, as he interrogates Jesus? It tells us in verse 38. He says, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate has examined Jesus, and he has found the accusations of the religious leaders spurious, unfounded. And at this point, Pilate should have acquitted Jesus and released him. However, we also noted that Pilate at this time was between a rock and a hard place. He knows that Jesus is envious. In fact, according to Matthew's account, chapter 28 and verse 18, he knows why the religious leaders brought Jesus. It says that they brought him out of envy. They were envious of Jesus. Pilate knows that. However, he also knows if he goes against the wishes of the religious leaders, they will complain to Caesar Tiberius one more time. And perhaps he'll be out of a job, maybe with his head even. Pilate has messed up far too many times in his jurisdiction. He's on thin ice with Rome, and they know that. So here's the deal. Pilate has two options. One, do the right thing, let an innocent man go, and in doing so, lose his job or maybe even his head, or do the wrong thing by executing an innocent man and remain in power. So he's, he's faced with one of two options. 
either the saving of his soul or the saving of his neck. Now, here's the thing. There's something vague about one's soul. There's nothing vague about one's neck, right? And so he does what he does in this passage, which is tragic. And that brings us to our text today. So we left off in verse 38. We'll pick up in verse 39, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 19 and verse 16 today. And we're going to look at the final phase of this civil trial before Pilate. And there are five things that we'll look at as we divide up this passage. It all begins with the letter S. That's easy, at least for me, to remember. So we'll, we'll start off with the scheme, the scheming of Pilate. How can I get Jesus off my hands? Now, we find this in verses 39 through 40, but here's the thing. John's account doesn't give us any insight into the second phase before Herod, but the gospel of Luke does. So I want you to hold your finger here, and I want you to make a left just in the book before this to Luke, the gospel of Luke chapter 23. And I want to look at it, and we're going to catch ourselves right up into the same section we are linking with John's account. So turn, you'll see that. Turn to Luke 23, and we're going to pick up in verse 4. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to read Luke 23, verse 4. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. So that's exactly where we've been in John chapter 18. Same section. But it gives us some, also some insight. Here it is, verse 5. But they were more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Oh, and when Pilate heard Galilee, he asked that this man was a Galilean. Keep in mind, Jesus is from Nazareth. Jesus from Nazareth. That's right in the upper area, the northern area of Israel. That's the Galilean area. And as soon as he knew he belonged into Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at the time. So Herod, of course, is now in Jerusalem. Why would he be in Jerusalem? He's from Judea. What's well, the Passover? And Herod is Idumean, but also half Jewish. So he knows he's in town. I'll, so Pilate's thought is this, his scheme. I'll give him to Herod. He's off my hands. Let him deal with him. And now here we have his little appearance before Herod. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him. Now, keep in mind, this is Herod who had uh, beheaded John the Baptist. That's Jesus' cousin. Because he had heard many things, though, about Jesus. He hoped to see some miracle done by him. He's heard about Jesus, the miracle man. Got to have Jesus. Have him come on. Maybe he can do some tricks for us. And he questioned him with many words as well. But Jesus answered him nothing. He's not going to answer this fool of a king. And by the way, Herod was a horrible, horrible, treacherous man. We don't have even the time to develop that. And the chief priests and the scribes also stood vehemently, you know, accusing him. So understand the religious leaders had come as well, and they're yelling in the background, put him to death, he's horrible. Herod just, I don't want to hear from you guys. I just want Jesus to do some trick for me. Jesus does nothing. And so now Herod is infuriated. Verse 11, Herod, with his men of war, then treated him with contempt, mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. Oh, you're the king of the Jews, yeah? And he, what does he do? I'm not dealing with it. And he sends him back to Pilate. So that's the second phase in his quote-unquote civil trial. And Herod really wants nothing to do with him. So now Pilate has him back on his hands. And this is tough. But Pilate is still scheming. And Pilate is a pretty clever guy. He needs to come up with some way to get Jesus off his hands. So now as the crowd is assembled, verse 39, we pick it up in John 18. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at Passover. So the Romans would take a, a criminal, a Jewish criminal, and they would release him to the Jews during the Passover. This was a kind of a way of placating this vassal nation. Now, uh, Rome, of course, wasn't going to loose their death grip of the subject nation, but it was a nice way of trying to keep things in order while they were there. So, you know, Pilate says, wait a second. I, I can use this custom, and I can release the, the worst criminal we can come up with. We'll go and we'll look at who's in prison. We'll come up with the worst crumb we have, you know, and present him as well as Jesus side by side. And certainly the people will want this guy put back in prison. They'll let Jesus go, and I'll be off the hook. And, and we're told in verse 40 who they found, Barabbas. And, and we're told here, now, Barabbas was a robber. Now, the original language literally reads, he was a highwayman. 
And this was what was a term that was used to speak of robbers because you have these roads that would traverse uh, Israel. One of the most notorious was uh, Jericho to Jerusalem. It's still pretty notorious even today, by the way. And these men would lie in wait, and of course, they would rob people. And evidently, this man had done more than rob people. How do we know that? Well, the other three Gospels accounts also tell us that Barabbas was a murderer. He was a murderer. He perhaps murdered somebody uh, in a robbery or perhaps several murders or had incited something even in Jerusalem, and that's why he's arrested in here. But Pilate's probably thinking to himself, I couldn't have come up with a better contrast, right? I've got this lowly itinerant preacher from, from Galilee, but then I've got this hardened criminal, a convicted murderer. And keep in mind now, a large crowd has begun to assemble and Pilate knows what's been going on in his jurisdiction lately, by the way. He, he heard that when Jesus came into town, they, they heralded him as the Messiah. So perhaps these people will be there now as more people are assembling, and they'll say, oh, well, we want Jesus. So he's thinking to himself, I, I, I've definitely got Jesus, you know, off my hands. So he confidently questions the crowd in verse 39. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And he's expecting certainly a, a swift yes. But rather, they all cried out again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas? Now, if there was ever a double take for Pilate, it had to be here. I mean, what, what would possibly cause these people to ask out for Barabbas? Well, Mark's account fills us in with another detail. Mark 15 and verse 11. We know that Pilate, of course, as he's going, and he'd be going back and forth during this whole event several times, and now he's already gone. He's been checking out who do we have in prison and so forth. And while that's going on, the account of Mark tells us that the chief priests and the scribes were going throughout the crowd, telling them, ask for Jesus to be crucified. We want Jesus gone. No matter who he presents in front of us, we want Jesus dead. And so the religious leaders had incited a frenzy. And these people mindlessly asked for the release of a cold-blooded murderer instead of the sinless Savior, the Lamb of God. And so, no doubt with this crowd, some of the people there earlier in the week who cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Certainly some of those same people were here in this crowd, and they're crying out, crucify him. And so this whole scene also sadly points to the fickleness of unredeemed men. At one moment, they're crying out for the greatness of Jesus. At the next, for his crucifixion. And, and think about this as you look at these two men, as you think of Barabbas and Jesus presented before the people. On one hand, you have Barabbas. He, re he represents the depravity of man. On the other side, you have Jesus. He represents the holiness of God. What a contrast. You have the best in the universe, which is Jesus, the Son of God, and you have the worst in mankind, in Barabbas. And who do men choose? The worst. The worst. And this just shows us how blind we can all be in our unredeemed state. Isn't it true? I just think of how I lived my life before the Lord just enlightened me, before I saw the truth. I just remember just living my own life, my own way, living a degraded life, a rebellious life, doing my own thing, thinking I'm right in my own eyes, and whatever I think is right, that's my standard of righteousness. That's my standard of what's right and wrong. Why? What I think, and that's how most people operate, and, and they just choose ungodly things, and it's sad. And so here we see this this contrast, and, and we see here Pilate scheming. First, he tries to pawn Jesus off to Herod, and then he tries to, you know, uh, exercise this Passover custom. Neither works. Neither works. So we move from the scheming to the scourging. Again, Pilate is trying to get Jesus off his hands, so Pilate took Jesus, it says in verse 1, chapter 19, and scourged him. Now, he's trying to, if he can, by the scourging, have the religious leaders look at Jesus to say, that's enough. That's ultimately his goal here, if he can do that. Now, scourging is really such a horrible form of torture that nothing is worse than it than, than crucifixion. So Jesus undergoes two of the, the, of the worst forms of torture ever devised by fallen men. And this was really devised by the Romans and used by the Romans really to elicit 
confession by accused criminals. The victim is stripped of their clothes, so they're naked. They don't have any clothing on. They're naked. It's a, it's a sense of humiliation. And then they're taken to a post, and their, their arms are stretched taunt around the pole, so their, their, their muscles are taunt. And there they are laid open, their muscles exposed to the cat of nine or the scourging. So on this whip, you have several, you know, Uh, cords uh, or bands of leather at different lengths. And within them at intermittent points, you have serrated uh, metal as well as bits of bone. And now they scourge the back of the victim. But it's not just one person. They use two people. They call them lictors. There would be two of them. And why two? Because it could tire you out, one guy doing it. And plus, the, the blows aren't as strong at the end. So they take turns. So the person beating them has to take the full brunt of it. Josephus, the historian, records for us that bones would be left bare. Bone left bare in a person, all of the flesh taken off. Eusebius reports that veins, arteries, and organs would often be exposed. It's a, it's a horrible form of torture. And it's not just the back. As the whip goes, it goes across the back. It goes across the back of the legs to the front of the legs, to the front, to the back of the neck. It, it encompasses the entire body. And again, this was used to elicit confession. So if a victim begins to confess their crime, they might even stop, or at least it is lessened. But because Jesus has done nothing wrong, because Jesus has nothing to confess, he receives the full force of all the scourging. And this is a fulfillment of scripture. First is silence. Isaiah 53, 7 says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before shears is silent, and he did not open his mouth. So Jesus would say nothing. He had nothing to confess. And then the stripes, well, again, Isaiah 53 and verse 5, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement he takes is for my peace, and by his stripes there is healing. So Jesus is scourged. And then on top of that, he was mocked. Because you remember that he told, our old Pilate asked him in the first interview, are you a king? Jesus said, you say rightly, but my kingdom is not of this world. And so this message or this has been passed along to some of the guards, so now they're mocking him. And the soldiers then, verse 2, take a twisted crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Now we know that the guards would play games with the convicted victims, We not only have writings of it, we have proof of it, physical proof. And so here is Jesus, and he's taken before these men, and they brutalize him. They take a crown of thorns, and they push it on his brow. This, uh, you might think, well, that's not that bad, but we know that there are two main nerves that are in the scalp. And when these are incited, it is some of the most debilitating pain a person can develop. In fact, if you have those affected, uh, many that have that, they can't stand, and they actually try to commit suicide. It is so hard. So this, this would have activated those, and it just shoots fiery, fiery pain throughout your head and even your body. So this is what Jesus is going through, even as the blood is dripping down from now his brow and meeting with the blood that's already been lost through the scourging, which, by the way, you could often bleed out from scourging. Or if you didn't die from, you know, a cross, you would die from affection. As we said, the organs exposed and everything else. And here he is with now with this crown of thorns. Now, it's interesting. Where's the first place we find thorns? It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. The thorns are on this earth because of the curse of sin. And here Jesus now, he becomes a curse for us. He's beginning to even wear the curse that was brought upon the earth. And then, of course, he'll ultimately go to the cross. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. He's taking our curse. He became, he who knew no sin, the Bible says, became sin for us that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's so hard to comprehend. So they're mocking him, a mock king with a crown. And it tells us they put on a purple robe, that purple that's the color of royalty. But I believe that as they're putting this robe on Jesus, it's just symbolic of the the sin he's taking upon himself. 
By the way, later on, they'll take this robe off, and it's a little bit later in time. It tells us they take it off. But understand, his back is ripped open, and now the blood will begin to coagulate with this robe that is placed on Jesus for a good period of time, and then they will rip it off as he'll hang on a cross naked. And imagine the pain. But I think there's a beautiful picture here as this robe is placed on Jesus, symbol of him taking our sin. There's a great passage in Isaiah 61.10. It says that because or through faith in Jesus Christ, I, I experienced the robes of righteousness. Jesus extends to me robes of righteousness as a child of God because of what he took for me. And then verse 3, they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Imagine just, why why would you need to hit him anymore? But they continued to beat him. In fact, in Matthew's account, chapter 27 and verse 29, it says they also gave him a scepter, a a reed, a mock scepter. You know, the, the crown, the robe, and the reed. But then they took it out of his hand and they began to pound him over the head. Again, firing those nerves and making it even worse. And to realize that this is the Lord of glory. This is the king of all creation. Such humiliation, such physical abuse. And for me, for us, it just demonstrates the forbearance of Jesus, the love to keep going through this. So Pilate tries to scheme Jesus off of him. He scourges him. And then we see the scorn in verses 4 through 7. Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know I find no fault in him. And this is now the second time. The first time was chapter 18, verse 38. And now a second time. He's innocent. Well, if he's innocent, Pilate, why did you scourge him? Well, in one sense, Pilate wants to think he's a just man, right? Yet he just brutalized a, an innocent man. But Pilate, of course, what he's trying to do, he's trying to placate the the religious leaders. He's hoping that they will just see how brutalized Jesus has been up to this point, and they'll dismiss the case. That's what he's hoping. Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no fault in him. In other words, I think that once I bring him out to you and I pronounce my innocence, he's innocent, and I think once you see him, you'll say, that's enough, that's enough. And so now comes Jesus, verse 5. Jesus comes out. He's wearing the crown of thorns. He's wearing the purple robe. And Pilate says, behold the man. This is the man. This is the man that you're worried about, that you're worried is going to take over, you know, Rome. This is the man that you're saying is going to overthrow your religious establishment. Look at him. Has he not suffered enough? He's the dangerous criminal kind of a thing. And by the way, Jesus would have looked like a mess. And I want to give you some description that the Bible gives us through prophecy. In Isaiah 52 and verse 14, it says, His face was marred more than any man. More than any man. So you can think of any accident you've seen in your lifetime and what someone looks like when their body is just messed up and their face messed up. Jesus was worse. Certainly, with all the blows that he's taken, hundreds and hundreds of blows to the face, his head is swollen to twice the size. What little water there is in his body because he's begun to dehydrate terribly and, like I said, begin to bleed out. But so beat up, he could probably hardly see. He could hardly stand. Isaiah 53 in verse 2 gives us another picture. It says he has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we would desire him. We, We would just say... It's horrible. So his back is ripped open, his face is swollen, he's scourged, and, and Pilate has allowed this to happen, and he now puts Jesus before them, before the whole group like a grotesque monster only to be pitied. Just pity him. And, and you would think that'd be enough for the relig- religious leaders, but it's not. Therefore, verse 6, when the chief priests and officers saw him... They see that. They cried out. Kradzo is the Greek word. It means to cry out at the top of your lungs, literally to shriek. And what do they shriek? What do they Crucify him. Crucify him. By the way, it's an heiress imperative of well, which means do it right away. Crucify him. Get him out of here. Get him. Go. That's how horrible. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is teaching through the Gospel of John. Almost all scholars, both Christians and non-Christians, agree that Jesus was a real person. But was he in fact the Son of God? Was Jesus just a man, or was he actually divine? 
The Apostle John starts the book by stating in no uncertain terms that Jesus existed ever since the beginning and that He is God. It was because Jesus claimed to be God that He was murdered by the Jewish religious leaders. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you believe that He is the Son of God? If you have any questions about what you heard today, we'd be happy to speak with you or even connect with you on our website. You can reach us at 281-648-5800. That number again is 281-648-5800. If you'd rather connect on our website, go to ltlradio.org and scroll to the bottom of the page. There, you'll find a form you can fill out to connect. We'd love to hear from you. Larger Than Life is the radio ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. To hear more messages like this one, head over to ltlradio.org. You can even download our mobile app to access all of Pastor Ron's teachings. Once more, all you need to know is ltlradio.org. Thanks for joining us today on Larger Than Life.